with a little thought experiment. Are we interested? We are. Okay. Imagine a healthy man suddenly out of the blue starts to have seizures, epileptic seizures. So he goes to a doctor. The neurologist scans the brain and finds out a tumor in the brain. So the person asks, can I have some form of surgery to remove the tumor? The doctor says, because of the location of the tumor, if they try to remove it, the damage to the surrounding brain tissue could be extensive, which can leave the person paralyzed for the rest of his life. So the doctor says that we recommend brain transplant. Now here, the person then agrees. Now here, I ask you, simply make a guess. We'll get to the answer anyway. Raise your hand if you think it will take more than a year for the person to recover all his healthy body functions. Anybody? Okay, that's a good thing, mostly, because there is no such thing as a brain transplant. And there will never be. Like the way we have other organ transplants, and I'll tell you why. We can live with another person's heart, kidney, liver, and so on, but not the brain. Why? Because you are the brain. You're born in your brain. You live in your brain. Your emotions, your ambitions, your thoughts, your ideas, your characteristics, your personality, everything that makes you who you are is born in the brain. Tiniest bit of damage to this three pound lump of jelly can change your personality, perception radically. It can basically change who you are. Now, so, let me give you an example. This is an actual medical case history. A man in his 40s, a decent gentleman all his, all his life, in his 40s suddenly starts behaving like a pedophile, suddenly shows symptoms of a pedophile. The wife does the rational thing and takes him to a doctor. When we scan the brain, we find out that there is indeed a tumor in the front part of the brain, in the frontal lobe. Now this frontal lobe, that's the brain region responsible for all our modern mental faculties. Reasoning, rational thinking, decision making, risk aversion, impulse control, self-control, and so on. So damage to this region can, uh, can impede in all of these modern mental faculties. And in this case, the tumor was pressing against the region, causing the person to lose all his healthy functionality of self-control. So after the surgery, once the tumor is removed, the person got back to his usual decent self. Now, so you see how you feel, how you think, how you behave, all of it is predicated upon the healthy functioning of your brain. Healthy brains create a healthy society. But here is a big question. What is society? You are. Each one of you are the society. The society is you. But here's the tricky part. Since the moment you're born, the society tries to condition you to feel, think, and behave the way the society does. And if it were successful in doing so, that is, condition all of its members to feel, think, and behave the same way, then we could not see any kind of progress whatsoever in the world, because progress requires original thinking. So how do we see progress? It's because of those handful of individuals whom the society fails to condition. These are the so-called misfits, the anomalies. These are the torchbearers of progress, and they are present in all times and ages in every field of human excellence. Let me give an example on that. For that, let's go back in time. About 1.5 million years ago, there was not a single creature on Earth that was not afraid of fire. But it all changed when a handful of our ancestors conquered their instinctive fear of fire and leaped into the blaze. These were them, the Homo erectus. They leaped into the blaze out of curiosity. And they arose triumphant, a few of them. They arose triumphant masters of fire, not just for themselves, but for their entire species. Suddenly, an entire new world of possibilities opened up to them. But for the first time in the history of life, a species had the upper hand against darkness, against cold weather, 
against predators. That is all the monstrosities of the wicked old mother nature. But more importantly, with the arrival of fire for the first time in the history of life on this planet, a species began to cook their meal. And that's a huge deal. We may take it for granted. The cooking the meal made the nutrition in the meal more accessible to the human body, more digestible to the human body. Especially, nutrition from cooked meat made a huge revolutionary impact upon the very evolution of the human race. It made the brain larger and more complex, which later led to the rise of all our modern mental faculties. So just imagine, because of the actions of a handful of our ancestors, an entire species took this massive leap forward in the path of becoming the masters of this planet. Yet, the society calls these individuals crazy. It's like if people don't call you crazy, you're not doing it right. Now, why? Why does the society call these individuals crazy? Why can't the society see what these handful of people can see? And that's precisely what the theme of this event is, the kaleidoscope of possibilities. Why can't the society perceive this vast array of possibilities which only a handful of people can? What is the actual scientific reason behind this? It's because of humankind's innate affinity to security. Security that comes along in a pattern. We all think that we love freedom, independence, right? But actually, your mind hates freedom because real freedom brings along a lot of things that are unknown. And your mind hates the unknown. It loves the known. It loves the systematic. It loves patterns. And anything that goes against your preconceived notion of a pattern is seen by the mind as a threat. That's why we have so many patterns in our society. Organized religions, organized political ideologies, and so on. Now, in each of these patterns, there are various key phrases, key verses that are used to maintain and nourish the integrity of these patterns in the mind of their believers. For example, in organized religion, we have our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then we have Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Then we have Ekomkar, Satnam, Kartapurat, Nirpaw, Nirpair, Akal Murat, Ajuni Sepang, Gur Prasad. Then we have Yada Yada Hidharmasta Glani Bhavati Bharata, Abhutthana Madharmasta Tadatmanam Sujami, Ham, and so on. Now, what is the purpose behind all of these glorious, venerated verses? The practical purpose. The purpose they serve in the society is self-preservation. When a person is raised in an environment saturated with these terms and verses, the mind gets conditioned to elicit a sense of comfort, a sense of security, whenever the person utters or listens to these verses. To such an extent that even if that person turns into an atheist in later life, still the brain circuits related to that conditioning remain intact. Thus making it possible for the person to feel a sense of calm in times of distress whenever he or she utters or listens to these verses. No. That's precisely what the purpose of a belief is. The purpose of a belief is self-preservation. Then we have cheaper alternatives to these grand patterns. That is, People love to believe in uh, astrology, psychics, tarot cards, palm reading, crystal balls, and so on. Biggest of them all, destiny. Because when you get rid of your very responsibility of your own life and leave it to some imaginary supernatural force, you feel less anxious, less insecure. So a belief takes away those anxieties. If everybody left things to destiny, then we could not see any progress in the world. So how do we see progress? It's because of those handful of individuals who actually see 
things the way they want to see and they actually stand up and act. Rest of humanity simply follows in their footsteps. Like the ones who harnessed the fire for the first time or the two brothers who were crazy enough to think that they could fly or this young woman who accompanied by her husband gave away her discovery of radium to the world free of charge instead of making billions out of it. Yet, the society calls these individuals crazy. So, everybody wants to change the world, right? Everybody, right? All of you want to change the world. But most people don't. Why? Because either they don't feel responsible enough or strong enough or they give up midway. Now, why do they give up in the middle? Why can't they persist all the way till the end? Because biology takes over. Biology drives them away from that ridiculously risky path of change to a more secure path, the path that everybody walks on. And for this purpose, Mother Nature has various tricks up her sleeve. For example, the most glorious of them is romantic love. And I'm specifying romantic love because there is a difference between love and romantic love. You can love humanity, but you're not going to sleep with all of humanity. Now, so Mother Nature on purpose drives us in the path of love and attachment so that we could finally reproduce. Because to your biology, survival of your genes is more important than accomplishment of your dreams. To your biology, your dreams do not matter, your passion doesn't matter. What matters is whether or not you're spreading your genes. Love is the most influential inspiration of all times, but it can also come in the way of your dreams. And when it does, all the words and expressions in the world won't make any difference. We can express our feelings to a beloved one in different ways. We can say, this is your my love. We can say, do be my son and shine. We can say, stand beneath Hayatamson. We can say, no puedo vivir sin ti. We can say, chong my sarahamida. We can say, nuvana jivitam. No matter which corner of the world we are from, no matter which tongue we speak, the yearning is the same. It's the yearning to have someone next to you while you achieve your dreams, while you walk your passion, while you walk through life. But in the pursuit of your dreams, if you keep neglecting the person whom you hold most dear, if you have such a person next to you, then no matter how perfect or ideal you think of your relationship to be, life can shove you off your rockers at any time. And when it does, all the purpose in your life won't matter. When it does, you will have to make some rather tough decisions. And here, there is no right or wrong decision here. Because either way, you will suffer. Suffering is an existential part of human life. So what matters is for you to know what is important to you. The point is, life is not going to give you anything out of good work because it has no purpose. Let's go slow here. Life has no purpose. Life has no meaning beyond the biological purpose of survival. As far as our biology is concerned, we are not meant to do anything special. On the other hand, we are not not meant to do anything special either. We are not a part of some grand plan of the universe. It feels good though to believe that the universe is somehow concerned for us and sending us signals. Because as I said, the purpose of belief is to take away your anxieties. So, when the universe sends us signals, we believe it just simply feels that the universe is concerned for us. But it has no relation to truth whatsoever. So, what matters in this human world is the purpose and meaning that you, the human, provide in your life. In your very purpose and meaning lies the salvation for your society as well as yourself. Your purpose can create a beautiful society. Or... You can choose not to act because it's too risky or too painful. But if you choose not to act, then nothing will change for you. No matter how much you hope, dream, or pray. Because prayers bring comfort, not change. Change requires tangible human action. So, my dear, dear sibling, no matter which field you are in, pick up an idea, any idea, a new business model, an innovation, a humanitarian endeavor, a civil service, music, choreography, filmmaking, literature, anything. Pick up an idea and go out into the world. Go out into the world and act. Act with all the might in your veins. Act with all the conscience in your nerves. Act beyond all dogmas, doctrines, and discriminations. So that the humanity of tomorrow 
will be grateful to you for delivering them a world of acceptance, a world of humaneness, and above all, a world of a unified, progressive humankind. Thank you very much.